Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's Christmas. That's right, it's Christmas. Well, how do you know? How do you know it's Christmas? Or how do you know it's getting close to Christmas? Maybe throughout the month, uh, you begin to see houses all lit up from the outside, Christmas lights, decorations, reindeer on the roof, those blow up Santa Clauses and snowmen out in the yards, stores, We'll have way more toys on the shelves than normal. Christmas trees will be selling where abandoned lots used to be. Holiday carols begin to play on the radio. And of course, you'll see the Salvation Army out in front of Walmart ringing their bells and asking for donations. So I think when you see all of these things taking place, you know that Christmas isn't too far away. These are all the signs of the season. But the Bible says that God also used a literal sign to get his birth announcement to the world. Luke chapter 2 says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who is with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in that same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, for fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Did you catch it? Did you? What was the Christmas sign? What did the angel say? The angel said, and this will be a sign for you, and here it is, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. Luke is our gospel writer. We've told you this, right? He's a doctor. He's trying to write a truthful, accurate, orderly account. Luke says, this story is true. I spoke to eyewitnesses. I read other accounts. Luke has files. He has folders. He has evidence. He's putting it all together so that you, the reader, would know the truth. Christmas isn't a movie. Christmas isn't a Christmas cartoon. It, it's a true story. In Colossians 4, Paul calls Luke his good friend and doctor. And actually, the Greek word there that Paul uses is the word healer, which is a different word than doctor. And it's kind of important because it's a higher status in the Latin than just medicus, what a doctor would be. A healer of Luke's position would have been a little more rare. Rome had about 14 healers, and in the surrounding towns, there was probably another five to 10. Those physicians were paid by the state, and it was their responsibility to supervise all the other doctors that were in their districts. So Luke is more than a doctor. He's really like a chief medical examiner. And if that's true, that means his family would have been exempt from paying taxes. He could not have been prosecuted. He wouldn't have been subject to having soldiers stay in his home he would have lived more like nobility. We also know that he would have had education, education that wasn't as common. He would have gone to school to study medicine, yes, but also grammar and philosophy and rhetoric. What is rhetoric? 
Well, a few weeks ago, we said that Luke, his book, has over 700 words that appear strictly in his book and nowhere else in the New Testament. So we know that Luke knows a lot of fancy words and he writes in perfect Greek. But rhetoric is an art of writing and it's designed to have a persuasive or impressive effect. How lucky for us then that an educated doctor skilled in rhetoric is chosen to write this gospel story. But why do I mention it? Why am I letting you know about it? Well, because Luke is using literary devices even right here at the beginning. He's using irony. Luke wants you to see contrast because he begins his book in the days of King Herod, right? A sentence that's dark. Luke introduces the Messiah then in darkness, these conditions, and we read the story. We say Jesus is born in dark times, but he brings light. And when you finish reading the Old Testament in Malachi, it seems that Israel is finally doing good. I mean, they're free of the Egyptians, free of the Babylonians, free of the Persians, and yet you start reading the New Testament and ugh, the Jews are back to being oppressed. The Jews are trying to live by the laws of Moses. They are looking forward to that long-awaited king and supposedly that king would come from the lineage of David, but they're currently living under a different king, a Roman king, a Gentile. In our story of Luke 2, Luke begins painting a dark canvas and then he splashes light all over it. It's a dark night sky. Shepherds are out keeping watch over their sheep. And then an angel turns the light of morning on and radiance and light and exclamation, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. But the story doesn't end there. Matthew picks it up in his second chapter. Matthew 2 says, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Now you remember in Luke's story, he had a sign. He said, you will find the king in an animal feeding trough. But Matthew had a sign as well, doesn't he? What's Matthew's sign? It's a huge glowing star in the sky. And just like how Luke's manger scene has lessons to teach us, Matthew's star can teach us a few things as well because there's layers to the star. Because on the one hand, you have the star and it's pulling the wise men forward across the desert. But on the other hand, you have the light of Christ and it shines in the darkness of every person. And while Luke tells his story with contrast and nuance, Matthew tells his story with trumpets and laser beams. In fact, Matthew is so excited about the star, he mentions it four times. So let's look at the Bethlehem star, and perhaps see some application for ourselves this morning. First, the star brought hope. 
Matthew 2.2 2 says the wise men go to Herod and ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, it's not really possible for us to know how long these wise men have been traveling since we don't know where they originally came from. I read one scholar who believed that it could have been as long as two years, but most researchers feel like they probably came from Persia because verse one says they were from the east and Persia is about a thousand miles from Bethlehem. Second, I know we always think of three wise men, but we're fairly certain they would have traveled in a much larger group for such a long journey. And when you travel in a caravan, you travel at the pace of your slowest person. So if they came from Persia and they averaged maybe 40 miles a day, they would have made it to Bethlehem in about a month. And this caravan has the world's first GPS, right? The Bethlehem star was their navigation. It was the compass it, and it was their encouragement to keep going. I mean, if you've ever grown tired or discouraged, it's great to have something to look at, to inspire you, to keep you going. And that, that star was always there for them. It was a visual reminder hanging in the sky that said, just over the next ridge, you're getting closer. You're gonna find the king. But you wanna know something cool? You and I have the advantage of reading the entire Bible. When we read a story like this, and because the wise men might not know the story of the Jewish exodus, but you and I do, how similar a story. The Hebrew people wandering in the desert, a long journey following a pillar of fire, a sign to direct them to something that was promised. Signs like this, they bring hope. You know, you're, you're wondering if you're lost. You're wondering if you're on the right path. And the sign lets you know this is the right direction. You're not lost. Keep going. Signs bring hope. And we all need hope. Not just on Christmas Day. I think oftentimes in our lives, it's, it's easy to see the manger, but not the Messiah. Just like all year long, we see our difficulties and we see the things that are going on in our lives. We just went through a year of despair and loneliness and self-pity and guilt and bitterness. And, and we see the manger and it's scratchy. It's filled with hay. It's made from crude slabs of wood. It's poor. It's uncomfortable. But despite the poor conditions of Jesus' birth, we have no sad faces on stage in the Christmas play. The shepherds are filled with joy. The wise men have hope. And Mary's heart, the Bible says, is full of treasure. Why? Well, because the manger is just the setting of the story. But the focus of the story is hope. Jeremiah 29 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know, people who have witnessed the work of Christ in their lives are often people who are filled with hope. Yes, of course, the star was light. It was direction. It was pulling them forward on the road, just like our hope pulls us and guides us and takes us hopefully closer to Jesus. But its role is more than just guidance. Signs give us hope. Second, the star exposed darkness. Matthew 2 says, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. When you keep reading the story past when the wise men discovered Jesus, we see Herod's true motives, don't we? In verse 16, it says, Then Herod went, he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men. He became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under. For Herod, this baby wasn't a king or a promise. No, this baby was a threat, a threat that would expose his darkness, a threat that would possibly remove his throne. So, 
Like all paranoid leaders who are drunk with power, Herod lashes out against the innocent. Herod's title was king, but he was a tyrant. Caesar Augustus was the emperor of Rome. His superfans called him a god, but it's possible that this great leader died of food poisoning. So Matthew and Luke go to great lengths to tell you that, no, Jesus is king. Jesus is God. He is not a phony like these other two. And when light exposes darkness, darkness runs and hides. Jesus wasn't fake. And this is why the Hebrew priests hated him so much. This is why they had him killed. Because Jesus was the real deal. And his perfect message, when it was compared side by side with theirs, it exposed them for who they were. Jesus taught and he interpreted the Hebrew Torah correctly. He didn't preach it for his own gain. His motivations were not driven by greed or power. The competing world wanted to silence him because his light exposed them. His light pulled back the darkness and showed everyone who they really were. And it really hasn't changed today. There is no truth in media or politics or entertainment. It's all a version of somebody's truth. The outside world is afraid of light because if it ever shines on you, it exposes you. Darkness breeds anonymity and it's a great place to hide, but the light of God defines and reveals. Listen, a dark and rebellious heart will always be at odds with the light of Christmas. And a rebellious heart will do anything it can to snuff out the light of Christ. But the good news is the light of Christmas does not come to rule us. The light of Christmas is not a law that we have to obey. It is not some heavy handed dictator. No, the light of Christmas came as a baby that could be held and kissed. This is my favorite Christmas picture. And I always find a way to work it into one of my Christmas messages. It's called Kissing the Face of God, and it's by Morgan Westling. And just as the light of Christmas exposes the rebellious heart, it also defines the broken one. As the dad in the house, it's always my job to fix broken things. Every year, I get duct tape and super glue in my Christmas stocking. But as I've grown older, and with my worsening eyesight, to truly be able to fix something, I need two more things. I need my glasses, and I need more light. When the angel comes to Mary to tell her that she would bear a child, the angel says, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Of course, Mary knew her situation. She knew she was poor. Mary knew the conditions of her uh, delivery. They weren't up to uh, chief medical examiner standards, but so what? So what? This was her savior. This was the Messiah. This was God coming to save his people. And it was God coming to save her. And just as the light of Christmas exposes the rebellious, it also defines the broken. And Jesus came for the broken. He came to make all things new. The light of Christmas brings us hope. It defines us and it illuminates the divine. The light of Christmas illuminates the divine. Matthew 2, 2 verse 9 says, And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. How many expeditions 
and quests end up with disappointment. The artifact or the treasure that you were searching for, it wasn't real. The map was wrong. X did not mark the spot. But now the star of God hangs over this small house and the wise men step in and then they see. There is his mother. There is his father. And the Bible says they fall to their feet and they worship him. Who do we worship? Well, worship is reserved for only those who are sovereign and divine. True, there were earthly rulers in Jesus' day who demanded to be treated as gods, but these wise men are not being forced to bow at this moment. No, they worship freely. Plus, the gifts they bring of gold, frankincense, and myrrh were more acknowledgments that this child was both God and King. These wise men, after such a long journey, had discovered the Christ, and they acknowledge that he is divine, and they give him their worship. Their hearts were full of joy and gladness, and they would never be the same again. You know, we spoke the other day about how the wise men found Jesus in a typical blue-collar home in Bethlehem, a king who deserved a throne, a king who deserved a mansion, was found in a stable room, lying in a manger. But you know, I'm glad the wise men didn't find Jesus in a mansion, because it reminds me that wherever I meet Jesus, whether it's in the Bible or at church, the place where I meet him becomes a mansion. Yes, even this little church in Montgomery where the carpet leaks when it rains. And so when I enter the doors of our church, I do so with all humility. I will never plop myself down in a pew, arms crossed, daring the pastor to keep me awake for 30 minutes. I wouldn't dream of making any part of this hour about me or what I want or what I expect. No, my place in this hour is on my knees. The wise men knew it. Even in a room set aside for animals, the room that Jesus was in now became holy ground. You, me, us, right now, we are on holy ground. And we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And the wise men, they didn't just bow, did they? No, the wise men brought treasure they came with gifts. They had gifts for the Christ child, gifts fit for a king, because that's what Jesus was, even though he didn't look like it. And as we bring our gifts to the Lord, let us remember who he is. He is our king. He's not the tax man. He's not Medicare. He doesn't get our scraps and leftovers. No, he deserves our first. He deserves our best. And even if we do give our best, it's still so far short of what he deserves. And then when the Magi leave, they're told in a dream to head home by a different route, a route that wouldn't take them past King Herod as they had originally planned. And so when we return home this morning, I challenge you to take a different route as well. If you came here angry with your neighbor, go home by a different way. Go home with forgiveness. If you arrived with bitterness due to a family member, go home with peace. If you showed up jealous from a friend who has more than you this Christmas, go home content because Jesus loves you. And he promises to provide all the things that you need. You can go home a different route because you have been in the presence of the king this morning. You have received hope this morning and you have basked in his divine light. The signs we follow today, they may have changed, but God still wants men and women everywhere to seek 
and to find his son. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this Christmas season. For as much as the tinsel and the lights and the decorations fill us with excitement and wonder, Lord, it is the scratchy, itchy manger that fills us with joy. It is the star that shines in the night sky that fills us with hope, that encourages us. Yes, it shines on us and it exposes us for who we are, but at the same time, it exposes you for who you are. This Christmas, may you be the king that you deserve to be, shining in the hearts of each person, your radiant light, giving love and grace to all the world. Peace on earth, goodwill to all. This Christmas, every day we live, it should be about you, bringing our worship, our treasures, and falling down on our knees to you. This place that we are in right now, wherever it may be, is holy ground because we are in your presence and we worship you, Father God, we worship you this Christmas. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here. We just want to encourage you and remind you that we are here uh, every Sunday. We have two services, one at 930, which is traditional. We have uh, a choir and we sing hymns and we have an 11 o'clock service, which is more contemporary, and we have a worship team. Christmas Eve is December 24th, and we're going to have one service at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, we'll have one service. We'll all be together. We'll sing some hymns. We'll have some fun time with the kids, and then we'll have our uh, glow stick candlelight service afterwards. And I've heard that after the service, there will be a very special guest out in our lobby to meet our children. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being with us this morning. I will see you next week.